welcome everybody, welcome to Church at Home. We're so glad you joined us today. Hey, wherever you are, let's give God our best today. And let's worship Him, He deserves it. Darkness run for cover yes. But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven I believe in signs and wonders I have resurrection power Yes I do but Still the miracle that I just can't get over My name registered in heaven yes my praise belongs to you forever yes this is my testimony from death to life cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'll testify this is my testimony this is my testimony Sons and daughters, bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Yes, our God will finish what He started. Yes, this is my testimony from death to life. Grace we wrote my story, I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony, this is my testimony. not done greater things still to come oh I believe if I'm not dead then you're not done greater things still to come oh I believe if I'm not dead then you're not done Testimony from death to life, cause grace we wrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'll testify. This is my testimony. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace we wrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus. We are so thankful for you, God, that you bring us life, Jesus. And God, right now, we just worship you with everything that we have. We fixed our eyes, our minds on you, Jesus. There's no one like you, Lord. Have your way, have your way right now. God, we love you so much, Jesus. I just wanna 
it's been a very hard season for me and in my family and 
my mom has been going through some health issues um, that have gotten worse and worse over the past several months and we've been to a lot of doctors a lot of tests have been taken and there's just like no results um, they don't understand why and and, you know, in those moments, I can think, God, like, what's going on? I don't get it. I don't, like, why does my mom have to go through this? I don't understand, but I catch myself in moments like that saying, God, I just need you. I just need you right now. And I need your presence. I need you to be with me. I need you to be with my family. And maybe, maybe you're going through something similar. Maybe you know somebody who has um, COVID-19, the virus, and it's affected them really just badly, or maybe you're dealing with finance and stuff, or your job, you know, maybe you're furloughed or laid off in the season, and it's really hard right now, um, or maybe you're dealing with, you know, d- depression, because you've been isolated for so long, and you've never dealt with this before, and anxiety or stress, and I want you to know, I think the best thing that you can say in moments like this is just say, Jesus, I need you. I I want you only. And I can tell you with confidence that when you say that, one, God hears you. He does. And when, when you say, Jesus, I need you, I also know that he will meet you where you are. The thing is, I know he has not forgotten my mom and he has not forgotten you. And he's not gonna forget what you're going through. He sees every part of your life. He sees every detail of your life. And I believe God will move. Just say, I need you, Jesus. I need your presence because when his presence comes, there starts to, a shift starts to happen. You start to feel hope. You start to feel joy. You start to feel peace and comfort. And that's only because God is, he's so powerful. And I know that God's in control. I know that God's in control of your situation. I know God's in control of my situation. And so do not lose hope. And I just want to take a moment right now where you verbally out loud are saying, God, I need you. I need you. God, I'm desperate for your presence. I only want you. Nothing else matters. I can't rely on anything else. I can't rely on my job. I can't rely on finances. I can't rely on doctors. I can only rely on you, Jesus. So right now, come on, we just sing. Nothing else, oh yes. Nothing else, oh no. Nothing else will do, oh Lord. I just want
We're so thankful for who you are and for everything that you've done for us, Lord. And hey, everyone, we just wanna welcome you again to church at home. We're gonna throw 60 seconds on the clock and what this is is a time for you to connect with someone around you. If you have someone at your watch party today, why don't you just give them a hug, give them a high five, or if you're watching live, why don't you just throw something in the chat right now and we will get ready for the next part of the service. Well, welcome to Church at Home, and we're so grateful that you're hanging out with us today. And I wanna give a very special welcome to anybody that may be hanging out with us here at Queen City Church for the very first time. Know that we are so grateful that you chose to hang out with us today, and we would love to know that you're hanging out with us. The easiest way to do that is to fill out what we call an online connection card. And if you're watching right now on our live stream, you can find that at the very top of the page. Just click that and fill that out. If you're not, you can always find it at queencitypeople.com slash connection card. And I just wanna make sure that you know it's a very safe card to fill out. We're not gonna just fill your, uh, your email inbox with spam. Here's all we wanna do. We just wanna send you one email just telling you a little bit more about our church and thanking you for being with us today. And before we jump into the message this week, which is gonna be amazing, by the way, uh, I did want to give you just a couple updates. One, if you would like to give today, maybe you would like to do that, that's on your heart, you can do that one of three ways. And they're gonna put that on the screen. You can give online or by text or through our app. And as always, please feel no pressure, no guilt whatsoever. Generosity is our privilege, but to those of you who call Queen City Church home, who throughout this entire pandemic have been faithfully and consistently giving and tithing, I just wanna thank you so much just for your generosity. I say this every week, but I really mean it. Know that your generosity is making a difference and it is leading to changed lives. You know, one of the things that we have done as a church and been committed to do from day one of our church is to invest into church planning. Like we love, we love to help pastors with a dream in their heart to really be able to start brand new life-giving churches all around our country, all around our world. And even during this coronavirus season, we've been able to continue to invest into church planning. In fact, over the last 20 weeks, because of your faithful generosity, we've been able to invest $7,400 into church planning. And that will go directly to starting brand new churches that God will use to change a whole lot of lives, that individuals that are now lost will become found, that, that families and marriages that are broken are gonna be restored, that cities are gonna be forever changed. I'm telling you, God's gonna take those churches and make a massive difference. So whenever I or somebody else tells you each and every week that your giving is making a massive difference and leading towards changed lives, it really is. So thank you so much just for your generosity. Also. Next Sunday, we are starting a brand new series called Run It Back. And I'll be back preaching after a short preaching break. Um, and I, I really, I, can't, I couldn't be more excited for this series. If you've never heard the phrase, run it back, I looked it up in the most uh, official way in Urban Dictionary. And this is what Urban Dictionary says and defines this, this term, run it back. It says, in any game, 
Most commonly basketball, which that's where I've heard it a lot. I played basketball all growing up. It says most commonly basketball or Halo. So all my gamers out there, maybe you're very familiar with this. So in any game, most commonly basketball or Halo is to keep the same teams and have a rematch. In other words, run it back means just simply play it again. And so during this series, we're gonna be able to look back at some of the most impactful messages in series from our first 100 weeks as a church. In a couple weeks, will be 100 weeks since we launched our church. And we're gonna look back at some of the messages in the, in the series, and we're going to run them back. And I'll preach, I'll kind of re-preach those messages again. Like it, it won't be like playing old messages. It'll be a, like, I'll preach it live again, except in the context with everything that's happening right now in our world. And so whether you were here or not, so maybe you were here on launch Sunday and you've been a part with the, you've been a, a part of what we're doing the last hundred weeks, or maybe you're, you're new to our church and maybe you just started hanging out when we've been doing this church online thing. So whether you were here or not throughout those hundred weeks, I believe that these are gonna be some much needed reminders for us all. It's gonna be a lot of fun. And more importantly, here's what I believe, it's gonna be very helpful. And especially in this season that we all find ourselves in. Again, that series, Run It Back, will start next week. But this week, we are in for a very special treat. I'm so excited. I've asked four people from within our church to share today. Four people are gonna share a seven minute message answering one question that I gave them weeks ago. And that question is this, what is the one, the number one thing that God has taught you in this crazy season? And I couldn't be more proud of all four of them. They've worked so hard to make today happen. Some of them, this will be the very first time they've done anything like this. And so let's do this as a church. Let's lean in, let's support them, let's encourage them. Let's, let's make sure that, you know, whatever they say, like that, that we're responding with a good amen or that that's good or preach that or tell the truth and shame the devil, whatever that you want to say, let's just make sure, let's blow up the chat and let's make sure that we encourage them. Uh, but more importantly, let's, before they share, let's pray and let's invite God to speak to us because I believe he wants to speak to you today. And so let's pray and invite him to do that. So God, we love you. We thank you for today. We're so grateful for the gift of today. And God, we do not want to go through the motions. We don't want to play church. We want to hear from you. And I know that you're going to speak. So God, we position ourselves right now in a posture to listen. And we give you permission to speak into any area of our life. We're listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, my name is Tiffany Dace and I have the honor of serving on our leadership team at Queen City. I just wanna take a moment to thank Brian for allowing four of us to talk about our experiences throughout this crazy season. To prepare, turn in your Bibles to Philippians 4. We'll get there in just a bit. But speaking of seasons, what a crazy season we're in right now. Like most people, I had in my head exactly what 2020 would look like and it was good. Then COVID came. I expected things to leave just as quickly as they came, but then slowly but surely, things were canceled. School, canceled. Celebrations, canceled. Grocery shopping, canceled. Sports, yeah, that was canceled too. Despite the many valleys involved though, there were so many learning experiences that I had throughout this season. And there's one in particular that I wanna walk through with you guys today. So what's the one thing that I've learned throughout this season? To surrender my life completely to God. I know many of us have heard or used the term, just give it to God. I usually hear that when I'm pouring out myself to someone about a problem that I'm having and that's their response. And in response, they just get a blank stare from me. Like, that's it? That's all you have for me? But little did I know that was really all that I needed. I've always been so focused on the plan that I had for my life and maintaining a strong hold or timeline on things that I would get upset or frustrated when things wouldn't go my way. 
But Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, Do not be anxious for anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The missing part for me was I was not trusting in God. I wanted to man maintain control, but he wants us to trust in him and wants to take our burdens away. In Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Doesn't that sound so peaceful and so comforting? But here's the thing, it doesn't have to just sound peaceful, that can literally be your life. When we start to surrender to him and take our hands off of things, not only is it going to give us peace, but it's also going to allow him to move in a way that would blow your mind. And that's something that I experienced in this season as well. So the most impactful thing that I had to surrender was my fear and my worry. When the coronavirus hit, I was incredibly scared that someone that I knew would be impacted by it. I wasn't so much worried about myself, but I was just worried about any of the people that I love dearly. And that's exactly what happened. Very early on, two people that I love dearly were diagnosed with the coronavirus, and I was crushed. One was admitted to the hospital alone. The other had to deal with the virus alone at home. I cried, I prayed, I begged, I pleaded, and I worried nonstop. But that worry was leading me to feelings of hopelessness. I'm usually pretty consistent when something happens. I can usually pick up the pieces and move forward, but this was different. We didn't know what was going to happen. We had no control over anything, and the virus is still so new. I couldn't even see them in person, and that was the part that hurt the most, more than anything. But in this season, it wasn't just me that experienced this. Everyone's control was stripped away from them. So what was it for you? Was it not being able to go back to school? Was it the loss of a job, the loss of a business? Was it depression? Was it homeschooling your kids? God bless you all <laughs> for doing that. Whatever it was though, we all had something. But even bigger than that, we also all have God, thankfully. These are a few verses that I love so much that helped me through this season. In Psalm 46, one through three, it says, God is our refuge and strength and ever present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. The earth has given way in so many parts of our individual lives, but our job was never to try to hold it together. In my Bible commentary for Psalm 46, it actually says, when things are changing and threatening around you, focus on God. He is with you. He is your refuge. He helps you. Being still means to take your hands off and relax. Much easier said than done, but it comes with practice. The more I understood this though, the, the more the days changed. I rallied my prayer warriors and we presented it to God. And as a side note, thank you to all of the people who prayed with me, who, who just presented the request to God with me. And I just encourage you, if you don't have people in your life who speak truth into it and know the Bible, please focus on that first. It is so very important. And if you don't have it, we do have small groups coming up in the fall but refuse to live life alone. I cannot stress that enough. So as we continue to pray, the peace just grew within me. Anytime the storm tried to pull me back, anytime the news tried to remind me of how the deaths were, God reminded me of his truth and his power and who was in control. My prayers also changed into thanksgiving. Just like Philippians 4 said, I started to just thank God for what I was praying for. Thank you, God, for the healing. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness. Thank you, God, for walking with me through the storm. Thank you, God. More than anything, just thank you. I didn't have the answers yet. My people were not healed yet, but I was trusting in him. I was leaning on him and trusting that his plan was the right plan. 
But despite all odds, they did make it through and they were completely healed with a full recovery. I respect all doctors. I respect what the stats say, but have you ever been blown away by God's power? It, it will completely change who you lean on and who you trust in. Nothing is too much for my God, not even this season. So I used an analogy a while back in January when we were in 21 days of prayer and fasting, and I'm gonna bring a little snippet of that today. Um, but think about how many things that you lean on throughout your life. When something's wrong with your car, who do you surrender it to? The mechanic. When something's going on with your internet, who do you surrender it to? The internet service provider. When something's going on with your plumbing, who do you hopefully surrender it to? A plumber, don't, don't try to do that yourself. But more than anything, my point is, you surrender so much in your life to the experts. You trust in them to get the job done. You trust in them to bring you peace and to fix the problem. And ultimately, how amazing is it that we can trust in the expert of all things, and that's God. Even if you can't physically see the problem, God does. He sees it before it even happens. He works 24 seven, so you can always call on him. No matter what the scenario is, he is the expert. So in all things, in closing, just remember John 16, 33, and it says, we will have problems in this world. We know that it's inevitable, but be reminded and take heart that he has overcome the world. So trust in the expert and surrender. Hey, Queen City Church, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 6. And if I haven't had the chance to meet you yet, my name is Sam and I am so excited to share with you today. And first, I'd love to honor and thank Pastor Brian for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. And I wanna answer a question, and that is, what's the number one thing that I've learned during this crazy season? And for me, I've learned that I need to be prepared for battle. I need to be prepared for battle. And there's a, a, some verses in Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 17 that I wanna read with you. So verse 10 says, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm in church. I just wanna pause real quick at the end of verse 13 and point out that amazing promise that after the battle, you will still be standing firm. And I wanna remind you, church, that after this season is over, this crazy season we're in, we will still be standing firm, just like that verse says. Our church will be standing firm. You will be standing firm. Your family, your marriage, your hopes, your dreams, your purpose will still be standing firm. Let's jump back into verse 14. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And I love these verses. Uh, these verses I've read before. I've read about the armor of God before, but this time when I read this a few weeks ago, it just, it just God spoke to me differently. And, and these verses mention a battle. And I believe that the last few months of life could be considered a battle. And here's something I saw that stood out to me. And in verse 11, uh, it says twice in these verses to put on all of God's armor. Verse 11, it says, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. Verse 13 says, therefore put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. And it doesn't say put on one or two or just three pieces, but all of God's armor. So that means put it all on. The helmet of salvation, the breastplate of God's righteousness, the belt of truth, the shoes, of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, the word of God. And let me remind you that the text says, if we put all the pieces on, we win. The result is winning. And I have this commentary that I use in my time with God from a pastor named Warren Wiersbe. And he spoke to these verses and he says this quote, 
The danger on the battlefield is that we do not take the enemy seriously and therefore fail to put on all of the armor. By faith, you put on the armor through prayer, which must be done at the beginning of every day. Never underestimate the strategy and strength of the devil. And like Pastor Warren says, the danger on the battlefield is not taking the enemy seriously. And I think about uh, John 10.10, 10, it says the enemy's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy us. So I think we need, I need to take the enemy seriously. So the question isn't, is there a battle? It's what are we wearing to battle? Like what am I wearing to battle? Think of it this way, what uniform are you wearing? What uniform am I wearing? I think about sports, I love sports. I grew up playing basketball and I wouldn't show up to a basketball game in full on football gear, head to toe pads, football helmet, cleats, that would be ridiculous. And I picture Joe Burrow, the, the new quarterback for the Cincinnati Bengals and he's in a basketball uniform in his first game. That would not be okay. You would think he's crazy. He's wearing the wrong uniform in church same thing, we have to put on the right uniform, the armor of God. Because the truth is, we all put on something. So what are you wearing? Are you wearing fear or the shield of faith? Are you wearing anxiety, discouragement? Are your, are your thoughts running wild? Or are you wearing the helmet of salvation? Are you wearing lies from the enemy or the belt of truth? And you may be wondering, well, Sam, how did, you, how did you get to this? How did you learn this? And I learned that I wasn't practically putting on the armor of God each day. The truth is, any day can be a battle. And after I read this, something clicked. And I don't ever want to go to battle unprepared. I don't think any of us ever want to go into a battle unprepared. Now, I'm not saying that if you wake up every day and you pray, in the morning and you put on the armor of God in your prayer that your day will be perfect and you won't have battles. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that it will help you go into the battle, it will help you during the battle, and it will help you stand firm after the battle. And like I said before, I did not have a rhythm of doing this. And I, and I do now. I have it in my phone actually, in a note, and I read that every morning. And if I can be vulnerable for a minute, I've had some battles the last eight months. Uh, back in November, I got a late night phone call from my brother telling me my dad passed away, unexpected, battle. Experienced holidays without my dad for the first time, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, battle. I go into 2020 and a couple months in, coronavirus takes over our world, battle. Church can't meet in person because of that. We still aren't meeting in person, battle. Father's Day comes around, battle. In the last eight months all collided at once a few weeks ago and I hit this wall mentally and I had a tough week mentally. But God revealed this armor of God principle to me and like I said, I started putting this into my life and praying and putting on the armor of God in the morning before I spent time with God and God's moved in my life. I haven't had perfect days ever since but I noticed a difference in my days because He's so good in church. In fact, I want to close by doing that just right now. I would love to pray the armor of God over you. So if you would, just close your eyes for just a moment. I'm going to pray this over us. God, I just thank you for who you are and how good you are. For how, God, thank you for how well you love us and take care of us and protect us. And I just want to pray over everyone listening right now, your armor, the armor of God. God, I pray that we put on the helmet of salvation to protect our minds from wrong thoughts. God, I pray that we put on the breastplate of your righteousness to protect our hearts from sinful and evil desires. God, I pray that we put on the belt of truth to protect us from lies told about us or told to us. God, I pray that we put on the shoes of the gospel of peace, that we may live out your word everywhere we go with every step we take. God, I pray that we pick up the shield of faith, that we are shielded from any attack or any arrows that the enemy throws our way, God. And I pray that we pick up and hold tightly to the sword of the Spirit, your word, God. And I pray that we consume your word, we keep your word in our hearts, and you give us boldness with your word so that we can speak truth. God, I pray all these things in your name. Amen. 
Well, what's up, everyone? My name is Noah Bates, and I get to serve on the Queen City Students team. And I'm just so thankful that you've joined us for Church at Home today. Go ahead and do me a favor. Turn, flip, or click in your Bible to Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. That's where we're going to be hanging out today. But when Pastor Brian asked us to prepare a message, the question he asked us was, what is the number one thing I've learned during this crazy season? And crazy is definitely the word I would use to describe it. I would say the number one thing that I've learned in this crazy season is that God and God alone is our provider. God and God alone is our provider. And when we go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, it's Jesus talking and he says this, That is why I tell you not to worry about your everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to Him than they are? See, this has been a learning season for me. This has been a season of learning that God is my provider and God alone. See, when Lexi and I, my wife, both got furloughed in March from our jobs, my stomach dropped. I can't even begin to explain the rush of thoughts and emotions, a lot of them rooted in fear and anxiety. And the best way I can describe it is is like the what ifs of life just started piling up in my mind. What if I can't make ends meet? What if we can't pay our bills on time? What if we grow deeper and deeper in debt and never are able to crawl out of it? And all I could think of is the word that describes that, the word that described all of those emotions, all of those feelings, was this word overwhelmed. I just felt overwhelmed by everything. And maybe you, like me, find yourself in a situation where you need a provider. Maybe you're feeling overwhelmed. Maybe your job hasn't bounced back. Maybe they've continued to cut your hours or you're facing a reduced income. Maybe you or a family member is sick. Um, Maybe that nest egg, that 401k, those savings are all dried up and all gone and you're facing anxiety and depression that's trying to smother you. I know that when I faced those feelings, I needed a reminder. I needed to be able to go somewhere and look and see the promises of God in my life. And I was doing my devos one morning and I actually stumbled across Psalm 23 verse one and it says this, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. And when I saw that verse, I knew that this would be one of the promises that I hold, that I held on to in this season. And I actually took a sticky note and a Sharpie and I wrote on that sticky note, I lack nothing. And I put it in the dashboard of my car because I knew I needed to be able to 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 be somewhere every single day and have a promise of God that he is my provider right there. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. So I would get in the driver's seat and I would see that, that promise of God. And it didn't matter how much gas was in the tank or how much money was in our bank account, I knew that I still didn't lack nothing. See, this today is a reminder for all of us that God and God alone is our provider, not our jobs, not the government stimulus check, not that PPP loan, nothing else in this world is our provider. God and God alone. Remember, when when you have Jesus, you lack nothing. See, when, when we talk about Matthew chapter 6, it says that God sees us as valuable and so he cares about our needs. See, I watched so many small miracles in my life in this past season. I watched as the price of our rent actually dropped when we went to go renew our lease. I watched the generosity of our church and total strangers uh, begin to provide for different needs, provide for groceries and bills. Things were, for, were covered that I would have never been able to cover on my own. And I actually watched doors open up for me to go back to work. I actually worked for Domino's Pizza in Norwood for two months during this stay at home quarantine season. And I truly believe that I would have never been able to work there, that job never would have come into my life if it wasn't for God. And I was kind of reminded of a worship song by Elevation Worship that we sing often at our church. 
And one of the lines in the bridge of that song says, not for a minute was I forsaken. I wanna remind you today, Queen City Church, not for a minute are you forsaken. God hasn't left you. God hasn't abandoned you. He never ever leaves us. He always provides. See, trusting God for providing means that we're giving up control of providing solely for ourselves. See, I watch God provide a lot of things in the physical in this, in this season, but I also watched him provide more than the physical in this season. Things money can't buy, like peace that passes all understanding, joy that filled me up day after day, wisdom, favor, strength, and so much more. In a season where my body wanted to feel fear, my spirit felt steadfast, and I know that that can happen for you today. See, there was a desperation in my heart for God and his presence. When I went to my devos, it was a different kind of desperation than it maybe have been a month or two earlier. And I know for a fact that when I drew near to God, he drew near to me. Romans 8 31 says this, what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he give us everything else? See, today, I wanna to remind you, church, that Jesus didn't just come to provide for our physical needs, he came to provide for our eternal need. See, Jesus provided the payment for the ultimate debt that erased the ultimate deficit that provided the ultimate provision. God and Jesus does not just redeem our circumstances, he redeems our lives. So I wanna encourage you today, church, if you feel like you're struggling, if you feel like you need a provider today, Jesus is here to provide for you. And I want to just take a couple of moments to pray for you today. If that's you, I would love to, maybe you just open your hands and I can pray for you today that God will be your provider. Jesus, we love you so much. And I'm so thankful for every single person watching this. God, I pray that you would provide peace for their lives. God, that you would provide all of their needs. And if today they need to make the decision to follow you, God, I pray that you would provide the courage to step into that today in Jesus' name. We love you so much. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Love you so much, church. Have a great day. Hi, church. I'm so excited to be with you today. If I haven't met you yet, I'm Heather. And I just wanted to take a minute. Um, this is not really what my message is about, but I felt very strongly today that I wanted to do this. And I just wanted to take a minute and say thank you to our leader, which I know is my husband, Brian, but I don't care. He has led us so well during this season, and I just wanted to tell you how grateful I am for you, um, how honored I am to be walking this journey with you, and it just means a lot to me. You know, this season has not been easy for any of us, and that doesn't exclude him either. And so I just wanted to encourage you today, if you have a minute and you have his number, send him an encouraging text, tell him what he means to you, send him a DM. Yes, I'm giving you permission to slide in his DMs just this once and let him know what he means to you. I think that would just really encourage him. Um, Brian, you're doing an amazing job. And so thank you for how you were leading us in this time. Um, and that's, we'll just get right into it. But if you'll turn with me to Genesis 3, that's where we're gonna start off today. Um, and if you do know me, then you know that I have two school-aged boys. So quarantine for me has looked like a lot of family time. It has been homeschooling. It has been um, trying to entertain them and trying to make the best of this completely unforeseen time. And so what I have come to find is that I am convinced that 98% of parenting is picking stuff up off the floor. And the other 2% is complaining about all the stuff on the floor. But really, uh, you know, this time I've spent a lot of time parenting um, at home, and what I have found is that the majority has been on this one topic, and so I wanted to share that with you today. 90% of what my kids get in trouble for right now is doing what they want instead of what I say or instead of what their dad says. That is what they are getting in trouble for. And let's just call it what it is. It's selfishness, and it's not new. It happened in page five of my Bible in the beginning when Eve is having a conversation with Satan. And so I'm gonna to read to you Genesis 3, 6. And it says, the woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took it, some of the fruit and ate it. So she wanted, so she took. And that's selfishness. 
That's exactly what it is. And here's the truth. Because of that, we're all born selfish. I am, you are, we all are. In fact, selfishness is in our nature. It's innate. It is how we are wired in us. And the truth is, I see this play out every day in my life because I did not have to teach the kids to say want or I want or mine. And I had to teach them how to say banana, but I did not have to teach them how to say I want. You know, they came with that. They were born self-focused. They came that way from the manufacturer. And so I'm having to deal with that every day and trying to drive that out of them as much as I can. I feel like that's a big job of parenting. But how many of you know that kids are a mirror? How many of you parents would attest to the fact that your kids are a mirror? And if you are not a parent, then you need to know this because many times our kids reflect us, good, bad, and ugly. And this is what God has been showing me in this time. It hasn't been this one aha moment where I've just like completely shifted my season in this time. No, it has been this consistent, constant theme that keeps popping up in my everyday life, everyday situations. And I've realized that I thought I was a pretty selfless person, honestly. So that's called pride. <laughs> but day after day, I would find myself face to face staring at my selfishness. And so I would take it to God and try to see, you know, like, what does he want to say about this? And this phrase kept popping up, and it was, die to self. Now, let me explain that, because that sounds kind of churchy. I don't think we say die to self in our regular day lives. But this is something that Jesus taught when he was teaching on earth. He said it a few times. And so I want to read to you in Luke 9, 23, Jesus said to them all, there was this crowd of people following him, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. And so every day I wake up, I have wants. Every day I wake up, I start thinking about myself. You know, I want to sleep later. I don't want to make someone's breakfast. What do I want to do with my day? We're all that way. The truth is we're that way and God knows it. And so God has even designed relationships in our lives that help us, that require us to deal with our selfishness. Marriage, it forces you to deal with it. Having kids, it makes you deal with it even more. But the truth that I've found is that if we're left to our own devices, we will always drift back to selfishness every time if we don't attend to it. I've been married 16 years, and nine of those years I've had children, and I'm still selfish. I still find myself thinking about what I want. And so every day we are presented with a choice. I have read through the Gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I see the people who followed Jesus, his disciples, were faced with this two approaches to life. They were faced with this internal battle that I think we face too, which is, am I gonna choose to live sacrifice or selfishness? Which way am I gonna live my life, in sacrifice or in selfishness? And so if you're you know, taking anything, any notes, I would love for you to write this down. This season has revealed to me that I'm not as selfless as I thought, not without intentionality. And that's why I believe that in Luke 9, they add, the Bible adds the word daily, because we have to daily lay our lives down. And so if you're taking notes, I said selfishness is innate, but selflessness is intentional. And so if you're taking notes, write that down. That is the biggest thing I've learned in this season is that while selfishness is innate, selflessness is intentional. So what does it mean to deny yourself? I think it's important that in, an, in a time where self-care is a big buzzword, that we don't get confused about what denying ourselves means, because it's not denying our needs. I actually love the way that Pastor Warren uh, says it, so I'm gonna read a quote from him, and this is what he says. We deny self when we surrender to Jesus and determine, which means we make a choice, to obey His will. And so Jesus teaches us that. He teaches us to lay down our lives for another, to lay them down daily, to take up our cross and follow Him. So to follow Jesus, we lay down our lives, we lay down our selfish desires, our selfish wants, and we have to train ourselves to be others focused, just like I have to train my children. So every day we have a choice between sacrifice or selfishness. And the truth is Jesus showed us the way. You know, He chose sacrifice. He chose to go to the cross. And He showed us the ultimate act of selflessness. And I wanted to show you this parallel from, we started with Eve in the garden. 
and her having a conversation and her choosing what she wanted. And so she took something. And now we find Jesus and Luke in a garden and he's talking to God. He's about to be arrested and go to the cross. And he has a totally different response. And this is what he says in Luke 22, 42. He says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And so basically Jesus is crying out to God saying like, I don't wanna do this. Is there any other way? But still, I'm gonna do what you want, not what I want. And it's a perfect example of that's the Jesus we're called to follow. That's what he's asking us to do. He instead takes his innocent life instead of our place. He takes my place, he takes your place, and he does something completely sacrificial. Um, and that's who we're called to follow. John 15, 13 says, greater loves has no one than this, that he would lay down his life for another. And that's what we're called to do. So we have a choice. Are we gonna be like Adam and Eve? And are we gonna be like Jesus? Are we gonna choose our selfish desires? Or are we gonna choose to be intentional? Are we gonna choose selfishness? Or are we gonna choose sacrifice? And so I wanna to read to you, Jesus is asking us again. He said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. But then I didn't read verse 24, which I wanna to read to you now that has a promise in it. And it says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. And I love that Jesus promises us that we find real life when we choose to follow him that real life is found when we give our life over to Him. And that's what I love about Jesus. I love that He never asked something of us that He wasn't willing to do Himself. You know, He laid His life down first when He asked us to lay down ours. He's already done it. He's already went to the cross, died, rose three days later, all so that you and I could be forgiven of our sin, so that we could have opportunity to have a real and close relationship with God. And you know, we do this every week, but we want to give that opportunity to anybody. If you want to start a relationship with God, we want to give you that opportunity to make that decision today. And so I just want to ask everybody if you would bow your head and close your eyes with me and just ask God. We do this every week. God, what are you saying to me? What are you speaking to me? You know, maybe it is something that stood out to you from one of our friends who shared today. Maybe it's this urge to go all in with God and make a decision to follow Jesus. Maybe you've had a relationship with God in the past and it's kind of just fizzled out. Maybe you feel far from God. Or maybe you have never started a relationship with God and you find yourself at church or watching this at home right now and you're wanting to start that with Jesus. If that's you, I invite you to pray this with me. And we just pray it in your heart. Jesus, I thank you for giving up your life for me. Thank you for forgiving my sin. I'm sorry that I've lived my life without you. Come live inside me, change me, make me brand new. I surrender my whole life to you and I choose to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you just prayed that prayer, you need to know that we are so proud of you. We do believe that is the most important decision of your life. So hear this, we are so, 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 proud of you. And then also, we would love to know that you made that decision so that we can help you, so that we can send you some next steps. Because truthfully, this whole thing that you just said yes to, like this is the very start. God's got so much in store for you and so much for your life. And so we want to help you. We've, we've actually designed our church in a way to help you navigate this thing called following Jesus. And so we would love to let you know, we would love for you to let us know that you made that decision. And so the best way to do that is to fill out that online connection card that's already been mentioned. And so if you're watching on live stream, it's up at the top, or you can always go at any time to queencitypeople.com slash connection card and you can fill that card out and let us know that you made that decision and we'll make sure to send you some next steps and just one final thing before we end and really this is for everybody let me put on my pastor hat just for a second and I just encourage you every single one of you to take some time this week to really think and pray through that question that those four communicators just so brilliantly articulated because they had to take some time to think through that. And I wanna encourage you this week, take some time to think through your answer 
to that question. What is the number one thing that God has taught you in this crazy season? Yeah, like it's a little bit of church at home homework. It's a very practical application step to make sure that what we're doing on Sundays is affecting our Mondays. Because here's what I know. Here's what I know. I know this from the bottom of my heart. And write this down, write this down. You may put your notes down, pick it back up and write this down because I wanna make sure that you understand that God never wastes a season. God never waste a season. In fact, in Romans chapter eight, verse 28, he says, so we are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together to fit into God's perfect plan of bringing good into our lives. For we are his lovers who've been called to fulfill his design purpose. In other words, that God can and he will use every single season that we're in, including pandemics and quarantines and unemployment and sickness and good days and hard days and blah days and everything in between. He will use it all for our good, to speak to us, to help us, to teach us. So don't miss what God is trying to speak to you right now, what he's trying to teach you right now here in the middle of this crazy season. What an incredible day. I don't know about you, but I feel full right now. And so I wanna thank you again just for joining us for Church at Home. Never forget that I love you so much, that I'm praying for you every single day, that I miss you. I cannot wait to spend time with you and to hang out with you again. And just remember that this will not last forever and that we will get through this. We will. And we will get through this. I think even more important than just getting through it, we're gonna get through it together. I love you guys so much. Have an amazing week.